First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. That'll be $23. Right, there's your change. Have a nice trip. Oh, I'll just get your bags out of the boot. Thank you very much. Now, George, let's find the check-in desk. Yes, but with all the changes they have made here at the airport, I'm not sure where the check-in desk is. I know, it's strange, isn't it? Why don't we ask for help? Good idea. What about that man sitting down over there? Which one? The one with the hat on and in the trolley? No, the one with the uniform behind the table. I'll ask him. Excuse me, could you tell me where the check-in desk for France Air is, please? Oh, um, let me think. The best way to get there would be to turn left at the end there, where the cafe is, and then go straight ahead until you're opposite the departure gate's entrance. Oh, no, 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 S sorry. Um, it might be quicker to turn right as soon as you get past the cafe and keep going along the corridor until you come to the sliding doors at the end. On the left. Yes, that's it. All the check-in counters are in a hall there. I'm pretty sure France Air is directly to your left as you walk in the hall. Thanks a lot. So, it's the left past the cafe and then right opposite... The bookshop. You can't miss it. Come on then, Lisa. We don't want to be late, and I want some time to get a cup of coffee and look around the bookshop. OK, George, but I want to go to the restroom first. I'll meet you at the check-in desk. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, I would like to check in for flight FA-492. Very good. Uh, can I have your ticket and passport, please? Oh, yes, here you are. OK, thanks. Uh, if you could just put your suitcase on the scales. Oh, I have this extra box that I want to take as well. OK, well... That's extra luggage, so I'll have to get you to fill out an excess baggage declaration certificate. It'll cost extra, I'm afraid. Let me see. Um, $40 exactly, if the total value of your contents is under $400. Oh, well, what's the form for? It's just a form you have to fill out, so that if there are any problems, we'll know where you are and how to contact you. So, if you can give me a few details, I'll key in the information. OK, then. Your passport says your name is Lavier. Is that right? Yes, George Lavier. George, uh, L-A-V-I-L-L-I-E-R-S. Good. Now, nationality. French? No, wait a minute. It's a Swiss passport. Well, yes, I live in France, but I was born in Switzerland. Swiss. Very good. Flight number... F-A-492, destination is... Paris. Are you connecting with any other flight in Paris, or will you be staying there? I'm spending my vacation in Paris. Well, Sèvres, just outside Paris. OK. So what's the phone number there? Um, let me think. The country code for France is, uh, 33, and the number is 19861-4537. Right, so that's... 331-9861-4537. Yes, that's it. And can you tell me briefly what you have in the box? Well, there are some books, just university textbooks from last semester. Some clothes and, uh, oh, yeah, my computer discs. OK, thank you. And what would be the approximate value of the contents? Mm, quite a bit, actually. About, um, yes, about $150. That's all. 
there's your receipt for the box, your passport and ticket, and here is your boarding pass. Gate 7. You can board the plane in about 35 minutes. Have a nice flight. That is the end of part 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Welcome to San Fernando City Tours. I'm Mark, your tour guide. We have a lot to see in three hours, so make sure you're comfortable. We'll be traveling into the historical district first, and then into the town center. After that, it's out to the harbor, and we'll finish up at the lighthouse, just past the harbor. That will take us up to midday, and after that, you're free to do what you want. At the lighthouse, you'll have a chance to visit the tea room and take photographs of the magnificent coastline. Now, as we have only three hours, we won't be able to take you around the shopping district, but we think you'd prefer to look around the shops there in your own time anyway. San Fernando has some well-known tourist attractions, the lighthouse, for example, and the National Library. However, the little-known military museum is not to be missed. Be sure to visit before you leave. Now, there's a lot to do in San Fernando. Indeed, there really is something for everyone. For those who love the water, I can recommend a trip on the Seafarer, one of the most famous boats on the San Fernando River. It does an evening trip with a three-course meal included. It's great fun for everyone, but especially for young people in their teens or twenties. After nine, there's a disco on the boat, and it gets really lively. Then there's a climbing wall near the town center. It's incredibly popular, with a large wall for expert climbers and a smaller wall for novices. There's a junior wall and a creche, so it's a great day out for those of you with kids. And if you like walking, there's some great walking tours. The city sites tour is highly recommended, as is the walking tour by the coast. But that one's only for the fit, not really suitable for children or the elderly. For more mature people, or those less able to get around, I would suggest a tour around the vineyards. It can be done in the luxury of a coach, and it's a wonderful way to explore the region's wines. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Naturally, there is a charge for all these attractions, but you can get 15% off if you have an Explorer Pass. If you don't have a pass but would like one, the driver here has application forms. Just ask him for one and fill it out while on the tour. Then you hand it into the tour office. Normally, it costs $10.00 but this year it's just seven dollars. When you hand it in, you'll get your picture taken for the card on the spot, and then your card is ready to use. Remember to show it whenever you pay for anything. The discounts apply not just to tourist attractions, but some bars and restaurants. Basically, everywhere you see a red explorer symbol.
Ah, we're coming up to the historical district now. If you'd like to look at That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing the best ways to study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, how are you both settling in? Fine. Yes, no problems. So far, anyway. Good. Remember that as your personal tutor, I'm here to help you if you do have any difficulties. Now, as you know, lectures start on Monday, so I thought we'd look at a few ways of making the most of them especially in terms of the notes you take. Let's begin by thinking about what you can do before you even go to the lecture. <laughs> Any ideas? Um, make sure you're up to date with all the background reading, so you know plenty about the subject already. Yes, that's essential. The lecturer will assume you have that knowledge. Anything else, Carlos? Well, uh, check what the topic's going to be. Of the lecture, that is. I'd go a bit further than that and consider what the content may be. Then you could ask yourself some questions that you want answering and listen out for the relevant information during the lecture. OK. Now that brings us to the lecture itself and the actual business of writing notes. But there is a lot to deal with there, so we'll come back to that later. What I'd like to do for the moment is continue with the process of note-taking and move on to the next stage. Any suggestions for what that might be? When the lecture is over, you mean? Yes, once you're able to sit down somewhere quiet with your notes. Uh, read them? More than that, you need to make sure they'll still make sense to you weeks, months later. Edit them? Yes, that's what's needed. Mm. It's well worth spending a few minutes on it. Any missing words, anything difficult to read, things you didn't have time to jot down, now is the time to do so, while everything's still fresh in your mind. Right. And after that, when's the best time to revise them? When do you think, Carlos? Um, I'd say just before the next lecture, in the same subject. Precisely. <laughs> That's a vital time to look at them again, for obvious reasons. But it's definitely not the only time. When should you revise them again? A month later, maybe? Uh, sooner, and much more often than that. I'd recommend you look at them again once a week. That's why it's so important they're complete and easy to follow. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right. Let's go back to note-taking and begin with the basics before the lecture has even started. What should you do when you walk into the room? Get a good seat. At the front, if you can. 
Uh, where you can hear clearly and avoid distractions. Yes, though obviously others will have had the same idea, so it's as well to get there a bit early. So, when the lecture's underway and you're busy jotting things down, what should you try to ensure? That you're getting all the main points. And what if you don't catch something, something you know must be important? Um, uh, I'd leave a space, then I could check it later. Perhaps by asking a question at the end and fill it in afterwards. That's an excellent way to deal with it, yes. Mm. And there's something else I'd like to mention here. Talking about going through notes afterwards, it's absolutely vital that what you write is legible for one very good reason. It saves time. You'll waste many hours during the course if your revision is held up because you can't read what you've written. Okay. What else can we do to make listening and note-taking more efficient? Well, I always listen out for signpost words. Uh, uh sorry. What are they? <laughs> they're the ones lecturers use to say where they're going. A bit like a signpost at a road junction, I suppose. Things like, the first reason is, however, to sum up, and so on. Yes. They can tell you when something important is coming and help you organize your notes, too. Is there anything else you can add, Carlos? Uh, there's something I think's very useful, but it's later, after the lecture is finished. Yeah, that's fine. Go on. Well, what I do is go through what I've written down, summing up the main points in a few words in the margin, on the left-hand side of the page. I try to use words that'll jog my memory, so that I can remember what everything's about when I look at them again. Yes, that can work very well. What some people do to review their notes is cover up their full notes from the lecture, maybe with a piece of paper or a card, and concentrate just on what they've put in the margin, trying to recall the details. Then they move the cover down a little and check whether they were right. Or you could put your main points on another piece of paper and clip them together. Instead of covering and uncovering, you just hold a page in each hand. Sure. It's down to personal preference, really. Everyone has their own learning style. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on research in the Indian Ocean. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this, the first lecture in our series on the changing face of the oceans of the world, we are going to look at the Indian Ocean, into which the Oceanography Department at the Institute here in Australia has been doing pioneering research over the past five years. Let us start with some facts about the Indian Ocean, to give you an idea of the scope and complexity of the enterprise we have undertaken. As you can see from the diagrams here on the screen, showing the relative size of the planet's five oceans, the Indian Ocean comes third after the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, but is larger than the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean. On this slide, 
you can see that the Indian Ocean is different from the two larger oceans in that it is landlocked to the north and does not extend into the cold regions of the North Pole. Covering some 73,440,000 square kilometres, the ocean constitutes approximately one-seventh of the Earth's surface and about 20% of the world's total ocean area. At the equator, it is around 6,400 kilometres wide, with the average depth being about 3,400 metres, and with the deepest point being the Java Trench at 7,450 metres. Flowing into the Indian Ocean, we have some of the world's greatest rivers. The Zambezi here, the Ganges here, the Indus, the Brahmaputra and the Tigris-Euphrates just here. The two largest islands in the Indian Ocean, Madagascar, here off the coast of Africa, and Sri Lanka, here off the southern tip of India, are structurally parts of the continents of Africa and Asia, while islands like the Seychelles are exposed tops of submerged ridges. The Maldives are low coral islands, and Mauritius and Réunion are volcanic cones. The surface waters of the ocean are warm, except where the ocean touches the cold waters to the south. A network of scientists, mainly oceanographers and meteorologists from around the world, are monitoring changes in the ocean's temperature and acidity, especially where it meets the southern ocean, in order to see how global warming is having an effect on the waters there. An assessment is also being carried out on how this is impacting on low-lying habitats and peoples in the more populated coastal regions around the rim of the ocean. In the warmer north, islands are vulnerable to even the subtlest changes in sea levels and tides, so they are being closely watched. Moreover, a close eye is being kept on wind changes, especially alterations to the monsoon rains, typhoons, cyclones and any other natural phenomena. In addition to the information sent from the ship that we have stationed off Antarctica in the south of the Indian Ocean, data are being transmitted round the clock from buoys anchored at various points around the ocean. Five of these buoys are observing ice packs and icebergs coming into the Indian Ocean from Antarctica. Besides the buoys, data on cloud cover and wind and temperature change are received by satellite. Satellite images are also being used to record the size of the icebergs from the moment they break off from Antarctica. Their course is then mapped as they move out into the Southern Ocean. Here at the Institute, the raw data from the various sources are received and the information is then constantly processed by a bank of computers. Once the data have been collated, the next step in the process is the analysis by experts here and at centres around the world looking for even the slightest shift in patterns of temperature, wind and sea levels. In the light of the fact that this is a global enterprise, the Institute is staffed 24 hours a day with researchers working in shifts, and we are in constant contact with centres all around the world. In total, 900 experts from around the globe are involved in the programme. The work at the Institute is now into the fifth year of a 10-year data collection which began in 2003. The analysis of the five years to 2008 will be published early in 2009. However, changes in patterns are already being noticed since the data have been gathered. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.